Last year, we held a couple of hui where the importance and the role of media in promoting social inclusion was explored by community and had together, you know, we create a new narrative for society. So shifting that conversation from exclusion to inclusion. And look, although we know public attitudes aren't wholly shaped by media, so in this age of hyper connectivity, where we all have these handheld devices and mobile phones, we have access to media 24 seven, and they do become powerful tools and some of the main drivers um, for public opinion, which can often endorse stereotypes and rhetoric that others communities. So this who today seeks to inspire and build the capacity of our communities organizations and individuals to proactively engage different forms of media and to promote most importantly our diverse voices so welcome um so who we also supports the great and existing work being done by like-minded community organizations in this space around media and ethnic communities so thank you to them too um and just to let you know, Belong Aotearoa in late August will be launching a community-led media campaign that challenges racism and promotes inclusion for people from migrant and former refugee backgrounds. And we plan to do this via allyship, be an ally. Um, the media campaign is also a call for positive change from people working with and for our communities. For the latest updates we do encourage you to follow us on facebook and via our brand new instagram page um, pass the mic dot aotearoa if you haven't already and now i'll pass back to malu so without further ado um that is a slow start i invite our first special guest speaker sharing the lived experiences of a community advocate Anja Raman is the founder of Inclusive Aotearoa Collective, of the Inclusive Aotearoa Collective, and a human rights activist. She also commits to many volunteer roles in the community. She was a founding member of the Islamic Women's Council of New Zealand, an organization formed in 1990 to bring Muslim women together and represent their concerns. Over the years, she has been chair, secretary, and for many years, the media spokesperson. She, was, she has also been a founding member and trustee of Shama. Last year, she was appointed as the trustee of Trust by Kato and for over a decade, a trustee of the trust that governs <coughs> Hamilton's community access broadcaster, Free FM. Her most recent project is the Inclusive Altero Collective with the vision to develop a national belonging and inclusion strategy following the 15th of March terrorist attacks. At the end of Anjum's presentation, we will be taking questions, so please put them in the chat box. And I'm please welcome Anjum, I pass the mic to you. Kia ora thank you, Malu. Um, I'm going to jump right in because I have a lot to say. I'm just trying to fit it into 10 minutes. So my own media journey basically probably began around 2002, um, and where acts of violence overseas were bringing a spotlight onto the Muslim community, and you'll be aware of 911, the Bali bombings, and those kinds of uh, events. And we had the situation in New Zealand where all kinds of people were speaking about our community, but no one from our community was offered the chance to respond. And on top of that, you know, at that time, 2002, you had Talkback Radio, you had Letters to the Editor, um, we had significant misinformation or one-sided information. So there were some people in the community that were trying to find ways to respond to this. Um, so one of my, the first things that I recall going to, was someone had organised in Hamilton for um, an expert from Australia to come to New Zealand and give us a one-day media training in Hamilton. And that really really changed the way that we thought about media. And one of the key messages that I still recall from them, this guy trying to convince us that, that the media are not our enemy. And it was a hard message for us to take when the media landscape was so incredibly hostile. Um, but he talked to us about building relationships with media organizations and journalists. Um, 
And also soon after that and around that time, Office of Ethnic Affairs, which is now Office of Ethnic Communities, um, offered media training, which I took up and they invited journalists um, from the Herald and I think Elliot Kram and a couple of others, which helped to develop some of those initial contacts. Um, but really the, the first area of access that was open to us back in those days was the letter to the editor which was the most read section of any daily newspaper and it was a really good skill to be able to learn to write your points within 200 words and making sure that you edited it yourself because otherwise the editor would edit it for you and maybe what you thought was the crucial bit was cut out so um, it really hones your writing skills and makes you think sharply and and makes you learn to make your points succinctly. So it's a good place to start. Um, the other thing, the next thing was offering to write. So um, being able to offer opinion pieces gives you an ability to have a public voice. Um, so you need to know how to make a coherent, reasoned and researched argument in four to 500 words. Now, not all of Ed, um, articles are that. In fact, many of your leading writers are not well researched, they're not often coherent, but for us who want to get into that space, we have to be twice as good as anything out there just to get your foot in the door. Um, one thing that helped me with that was writing, uh, was having a blog, and blogs were big back in the, those days, um, sort of late 2000s, um, and so that was a way for you to hone your skills in writing an opinion piece, but also if you had following getting um, comments and debating and also honing your ideas and thoughts around, um, you know, how to write and get your points across. Um, learning to do press releases, again, OEC ran an afternoon workshop, I recall, uh, I think Alistair Quinn was one of the presenters there, um, and he taught us how to order your press release, how to make sure you put in quotes, keep it short, your press release should never be more than a page, um, often less is more, making sure you have clear contact details of a person who can respond, and making sure that person and a backup are available to respond. Um, the best media training I have was as a political candidate through Brian Edwards Media. Um, and some tips that I remember about that, if you're called by a media person, you don't need to answer the questions immediately. And particularly when you're new to this and still learning, ask them what the questions are, ask them what they want you to comment on, then say you will call them back in half an hour, then consult. Like I always did that in the early stages, I made sure I had a small network of people who were well informed, who I could completely trust and I'd ring them up and say, I've just had a media query on this, what is our opinion? And, and we'd talk it through and, and then you call back and you are prepared. Um, you really need to think about the type of media. So if it's a main news bulletin, you'll have about 15 seconds to get your message across. If you're lucky, 30 seconds. They will interview you for five minutes and literally maybe one sentence or two sentences is what is gonna make the news broadcast. So prepare, be very clear about the message that you want to get across. Stick to the topic. Don't react to provocations. They will try to make you say things because they want it to be a really punchy sound bite. You stick to your message. Um, one of the best things that we got from Brian Edwards um, and his wife was the physical preparation. So, like, you, if you know that a media event is coming up, like, just beforehand, slow your breathing, consciously breathe deeper and slower and slow your breathing down which will slow your heart rate down counting backwards from 10 to 1 make sure that you sit up straight as straight as you can um, they actually made us put a cork in our mouth and practice talking with a cork in our mouth to to um, make sure that you can enunciate clearly it's worth it just try it not that i didn't do it but i've heard from a lot of people and if you're not confident or you're starting out definitely worth it. Physical appearance might help you. So if you have time for to prepare for that media event, dress in something that makes you feel confident. Um, be mindful of what you're wearing, no white, avoid loud patterns and stripes and all those kinds of things. 
take the time to think about your response. And especially if it's a pre-recorded interview, you don't have to jump in with an answer. You can sit with the question, give yourself a half a minute to think about how you want to respond and then give them the answer. If it's pre-recorded, you can ask them to scrub the answer and you know stop in the middle of a sentence, be like, oh no, no, I got that wrong, can we start again? And they'll be like, yep. And, and you start your sentence again. Um, one of the most important points, like crucial, you are never ever off the record. Once the phone is on, once you are in the room with any media person, be it the producer, be it the journalist, you are on the record. Even though they might say it to you, even though you might think it, speak as if you're on the record all the time. I don't even don't even go to off the record. It's not worth it. Um, Speak slowly. We all, especially in New Zealand, we speak really fast, you know, and I know I'm doing that right now and I'm sorry, it's just because I want to get through stuff and it feels strange when you slow your speaking down, it feels odd, it feels unnatural, so practice. Um, and also, as you speak slowly, you will start to take out the ums and the ahs and, and so on that that those fillers as you're thinking of the answer that you automatically make, you want to try and cut those out as much as you can. Definitely don't fill in silences left by the journalist. That's something that they will do is just leave the silent space and your mind will really push you to fill it in. This is something that happens on um, in trials for witnesses in the courtroom. Lawyers use this all the time is just leaving the silent space so that the witness will give more information that they otherwise wouldn't have given. Some of my media um, story was like by chance, well maybe not by chance, but it was because of other things I did. So one of my biggest breaks I got was because I submitted to a parliamentary inquiry onto hate speech. Now Willie Jackson was doing his eye to eye program at that point and they picked up the submission and called me um, so that I could be on that program, which was a half hour program on TV with ad breaks. And so the first time I got to go up against Judith Collins, um, yep, that Judith Collins, and second time I was up against Winston Peters. So they had me back on another topic. Um, and it was because of that second interview that then Close Up had me on at 7pm debating Winston Peters in the middle of a very nasty 2005 election campaign. Um, so, you know, it's, it's some, sometimes these one thing does lead to another. So again, it was about being prepared, being con, uh, consulting, being very clear about the message that I wanted to get across. Because one of his big things in that before that interview, his statement had been, if you don't agree with the values of New Zealand, then you should just leave. And I had prepared my line before I went on TV to say, I agree with you, Mr. Peters, that if you don't have the values of New Zealand, you should leave and our values are acceptance of other cultures, acceptance of diversity, so you need to be on the next plane out, which I said on live television, you know, um, but it, it, I had thought it through, I had my response ready, and I just waited for the opportunity to get it out. Pass the media call on to someone else when you don't have expertise, or you don't have time to prepare. And communities need to build that expertise. So just because someone is an academic or a scientist or some other expert, um, it doesn't mean that they will handle the media well. In fact, it's likely they won't because they aren't taught to communicate in short, sharp, you know, bursts. They're more, much more used to offering long explanations. So make sure you have people that you know that are trained that you can pass on calls to make sure you have something to offer on the subject. The media will not come back to you if you don't have something to solid to say that is relevant and can be presented. So seeking media contact for the sake of it or to build your own profile is a total waste of time. Ask yourself what you're there for. Who are you there for? What are you advocating for? If it's just about you, then just hang up and leave the room, go away not needed. Um, be prepared for hostility. 
And particularly now that we're in this online world, the comments under your article or video on social media, um, and especially if you're Muslim, but also for people of color, are incredibly critical and hostile. They're often coordinated attacks against you. They will tag you in, they will follow you on social media, they will send hostile messages either publicly or privately, they will threaten you, they will find your postal address and send you letters because unlike an email you can't delete and you can't block. The, their purpose is to silence you through hostility, so make sure that you have a support network. Learn about what you can do about these things. Go to NetSafe, go to the Human Rights Commission, go to the police, depending on the level of the threat and how they're interacting. Often they know very well what will get them in trouble and they stay just below that line, but enough to rattle you. Work on your resilience and your mental health. A strong social media profile helps with mainstream media. They look at the hits that they get on articles. So you need to share that story, have a strong social media profile so that it gets shared and they get the clips. So making sure that your networks are sharing it as well. Keep all the media contacts that you get, whether they're email or phone, and make sure that they have your contacts. Let them know that you're available. Build up your personal networks. So working in the community and letting your community know that you do media so that when they get calls, they pass them on to you. Often they get a call that they don't want to answer or they don't want to be in the media on that topic or any topic. So they need to have your name at the front of their mind. And a lot of my media appearances have been referrals from other people. Reporters have been sent to me by someone else and I do the same for other people. Um, if you're in a community organisation, have some designated media people. But really, I'll sum it up. Prepare, practice, train, build up your expertise. Don't just think that you can jump in. You, it's not safe to do that. So, sorry, I may have gone over time. No, no, no that's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Anja. I, I can't see any questions that come through, but a lot of what you've said um, really resonated, especially um, I guess the earlier points you made around that whole preparation. And um, I think sometimes even that breathing exercise that you were talking about, we can sometimes forget that we might know this stuff, but um, as you said, um, they're looking for, I guess, newsworthy sound bites and that we can take that moment to just pause and and come back to them but um if i just does any, does anyone want to ask any questions before we move on if you have questions later on just keep pushing them through and we can try to get to them later otherwise thank you anjum <laughs> oh good thanks thanks anjum um so now back to me and i want to invite our second special guest speaker to share how to advocate for positive change. Um, so today we have Jason Garman, he's the communications manager at Amnesty International Aotearoa New Zealand. Using images, research, stories and shared human values, he advocates for a better future for all of humanity. Previously he spent 11 years with Oxfam New Zealand working to end um, extreme inequality and help enable people um, in the developing world to live safe, dignified lives. The funny accent, his words, not mine, comes from growing up in the US where he used to campaign for endangered species and environmental justice with the Natural Resources Defence Council. Again, if you do have any questions, please do feel, feel free to ask Jason the questions at the end and put them in the chat box. Um, so Jason, welcome, and I now pass the mic to you. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's an honor. And I just want to, first of all, thank Anjum and just say that it's, um, it's, it's humbling to be on a panel with you. Anjum is a tremendous human being and uh, someone whom I respect deeply. That was an awesome, uh, very concise bit of media training um, from someone who, um, uh, who's a powerful advocate and you've obviously absorbed the the crux of it. I've done many media trainings over the years and you basically summed it all up in 10 minutes. So that's great. So you guys should take good note. She's given you all the, all the basic tools that you need. 
to deliver well in media. I'm going to take a, a little bit of um, a higher perspective because um, I think what I'd like to focus on is the fact that you can do this. And this is how we advocate for positive change. So many people are a bit hesitant to, to get involved. And uh, so I'm going to just spend 10 minutes here talking about how and why you, you should be getting involved and you should be getting yourself out into media. Now, doing media interviews isn't just about presenting your research. It's not about the facts. And this is something that we've come to know over the last few decades. Uh, many of us have been advocating for a long time and thinking, well, if we could just get the information out to people, then they'll make the right decision. And Garth, forgive me, I'm not sure what your workshop's going to be on, so hopefully I don't um, cover too much ground that you're also planning on covering. But essentially what psychologists have, have learned is that people don't map, they don't act, they don't make decisions necessarily on the information so much as on their worldview. They make decisions based on their values. And the good news is that as human beings, we all share a set of values and we can appeal to some common intrinsic values when we speak, when we communicate that are more likely to cause people to take pro-social uh, behaviors and decisions. So that's a bit of an aside. Now, what I'd like to mainly talk to you today is about telling stories. Like I said, this isn't just about coming out with a graph and, and a couple of statistics. Statistics are powerful, but human beings connect with each other through stories. And this is where your power lies, your power to change the world, your power to advocate, to do what you would like to do. Communities, which you are all a part of, are made up of people. Organizations, which many of you are a part of, are made up of people. People relate to people. And everyone has stories. I know what you're thinking. Many of you are thinking, well, I don't really, mm, don't really have much of a story. You do. Your stories are precious. And believe me, people do want to hear them. So what's the difference between a story and just some information? Well, one way to think of it is, don't just tell me that it was sunset. Tell me about the colors of the sunset. Tell me about the clouds. Tell me about the sounds that you could hear of the waves crashing on the shore. Does that make sense? Stories are color, they're sound, they're emotion. When you taste food from your childhood, how does it make you feel? What is it like? What does it feel like to have family members overseas who are getting older? Tell me about the sounds of the birds that you first heard outside your window when you came to New Zealand. And equally, it doesn't always have to be happy, happy. How did it feel when you heard a racist comment at work? It's not just reporting that I heard that racist comment, it's sharing that human side of you. How did it make you feel? And equally important, when was the last time a stranger did something kind for you? Now, this is a really important point, is that there's a lot of bad news out there and the media, which you've just learned how to engage with, unfortunately, are really good at honing in on bad news because bad news sells. So we need to work really hard to flip that on its head and present a positive vision of the future that doesn't alienate people and cause them to be burned out, depressed, and turn off. So that's not to say that we ignore the bad news that's going on. We absolutely have to acknowledge it, but we also need to leave people with some hope by presenting a vision of the future that brings them along with you. I think Anjum has pretty well covered some of the points about the fact that uh, if you get yourself out there and do some media, it creates an upward spiral. The more you tell your story, the more people will hear that story, the more journalists will hear you and will come to you and ask for that story or for the next comment on the next thing. So start where you are. If you've never done this before, that's okay. Dip a toe in the water. Just start. And it will, as you do more, spiral upwards. But please keep at it. Don't be disheartened. 
there are people pitching stories to journalists and it doesn't mean that every time you write a press release, it's going to get coverage. It doesn't mean that every time you write a letter to the editor, it's going to get published, but keep on trying and you will find success. What I think is important since this media hui is, is about some quite difficult dynamics combating racism is to please be confident in yourself, in your diversity, because a diverse community is a wonderful community. And the vast majority of New Zealanders are interested in people like you. The vast majority of New Zealanders, I would like to believe, at least I operate my life in this way, is to believe that they would welcome people like you. Your ethnicity is a great benefit to Aotearoa New Zealand. It's what makes us strong. So when you speak, when you interact, hold that at the forefront of your consciousness, not the negative stuff, not the racist stuff, not the trolly stuff. Now, three quickly aspects of this, um, of this big topic, the story, the channel and the format. So I've already kind of talked a bit about the story and I want to restress that we need to share that positive vision of the future. And one of the ways to do that is to appeal to these shared intrinsic values as human beings. Some of these values everybody has, well, everyone has all the values, but some of these values, when we appeal to these values, it's going to help trigger the kind of response that you would like to trigger. And those values are things like social justice, equality, wisdom, self-respect. So you want to set the frame of whatever you're doing, whatever media story it is, whatever communication it is. And this is a really critical point. As Anja mentioned, if you don't know the answer to something, you need to steer that to someone who does. Don't try to answer questions that you don't have the answer to. It's fine to say, I don't have the answer to that. But this is a little bit different. It's more than just that you may be getting questions that don't really fit the frame that you want to present. So you need to do your best to set the frame and not sit within someone else's frame. So if someone else is trying to get you to comment on a story, um, you can acknowledge that frame, but do your best to try to bring it to your key messages, to the story that you are prepared to share. And we've also talked about length, or Anjum has talked about length. So just be aware that often sound bites are the reality of your situation, particularly for broadcast media. If it's TV, if it's radio, you're gonna have to practice learning how to deliver a great sound bite that's a half a sentence long. You might only get 10 or 15 seconds, but it's doable. People do it all the time. Now the channels, Long gone are the days when you can really clearly separate traditional media from social media. We're in a 21st century world where everybody's on social media and the social media is feeding traditional media and vice versa. So these things need to be coordinated, but they are still separate in their own ways. For instance, on obviously your social media channels, you control that content completely. Whereas on traditional media or other people's social channels, not necessarily. Now, I did want to point out, since Anja mentioned uh, letters to the editor, that's an important way that you can get your message out there. I think one of the really underutilized tools is op-eds, and that stands for opposite the editorial page. It's basically the, the longer format pieces. Uh, that people can submit to, particularly to newspapers. And Anjum did mention this as well, but I would just recommend that you start reading them because there's a very specific format. There's a hook at the beginning, there's the kind of middle part, and then it wraps back around to the hook at the end. Start reading other people's opinion pieces that are in papers and realize the style. Um, and it, it's, it's very doable. So start reading them start writing them, start submitting them, and I'm quite confident that you'll get them out there. Now, the last one that I wanted to talk about was formats. 
speaking you've heard about uh, already. And Garth, that may be part of the training coming up is how to deliver a great interview or a great quote. Writing, obviously, as if, um, as if you're speaking though, we're not just presenting research reports, although that might be part of it, but we'd like to write as if you're speaking or writing to a person. Another thing is uh, that the world is increasingly becoming visual. And there are some absolutely wonderful filmmakers out there. And it's quite intimidating to think like, well, I'm not a photographer, I'm not a camera operator, I'm not an editor. But more and more, these tools are available to us. They're becoming cheaper or free. You can create videos. So start thinking about the stories that you would like to tell visually. Because that not only, not only helps, for instance, if TV crew is going to send a camera to where you are, but to help tell your story visually as well. We all have these incredible magic devices these days, and we can make video content on them as well as photos. So when you're thinking visually, just remember that a single image can bring about massive amounts of social change. So just keep that vision broad and realize that someone like you could take a photo that can make a big difference, that can change a lot of minds, that can move people in a direction that you would like to move them. Now there are other emerging ways to convey information and to bring people along. Animation is happening now more and more. And again, if you are considering commissioning someone to do animation for you, it's getting much cheaper than it used to be. So it's quite a powerful way to convey information or tell stories. But since this is a, a quite a diverse group, just recognize that that human connection that I mentioned before is often conveyed through the arts, through poetry, through performance, through music, through dance, through theater, through sharing the beauty of your culture. So it's not always about the, the tough pointy edges of the issue. Um, sometimes, important pieces of information uh, can be conveyed in really beautiful artistic ways. So just keep open to the creativity as well. Now, the last thing that I'll leave you with uh, is going to be a bit of an echo of the, the point that Anjum made, specifically honing in on delivering interviews, which is to practice. And it's nerve wracking. It's a little bit weird, but hopefully this um, workshop coming up will involve a little bit of practice, but it's perfectly fine to practice with a friend. You can also practice in the mirror at home if you don't have a friend or you're feeling a little bit self-conscious, but just rehearse, do it over and over again. People who deliver really great messages, they deliver them because they've done it lots of times, because they've practiced. So remember your key message, the thing that you want to get across and deliver that key message. If you get asked a question, acknowledge that question, but do your best to bring it back to the key message because you don't get too many chances to do it. Thank you so much. You can do this. Thank you for sharing yourself with the world. You're all wonderful, beautiful, diverse people. And I'm proud to call Aotearoa, New Zealand, my home, to have been an immigrant here, to be a citizen here now, and to live in a country with so much diversity. It makes me warm on the inside. And it's been a pleasure to be here with you today. Any questions, please, if you have any now, great. If you don't, then you can find me on Twitter and feel free to chase me up and I'm happy to do whatever I can to help you guys in the future. Nami. Thank you so much, Jason. That was um, a, a, some great tips there. I was frantically writing down all of these notes and then I remembered actually this is being recorded everyone. So we will be sharing this with you. And thanks again to Anjum as well. That was really incisive and heartfelt. As you were speaking, Jason, I was thinking of a, there were, I don't think there's any questions just in the chat box yet, but I loved what you said around, you know, people relate to people, so share the human side of yourself. And I loved that you said, you know, lots of bad news is, it's out there, that's because bad news sells, you know, so let's flip that narrative, um, give people hope and present a, a positive future. So thank you so much for that. Um, I did note one question from Sabine and, and perhaps Anjum and Jason, you may want to answer this. One was around, why do we speak so quickly? Do you think it's something cultural? <laughs> so I, if, if Jason and Anjum want to answer this question, I'll, I'll pass it to you both. 
Um, I'll start because I'm because I'm not muted yet. Anyway, um, I'll answer that by by bringing in an, an, another interesting little factoid. Uh, on the side, I also teach yoga, and part of that has to do with breathing. And apparently, human beings breathe about three or four times more rapidly than we did a hundred years ago. We're taking more breaths per minute, literally. And I think that's because the pace of life has increased so much. You know, we lead very busy lives. There is so much going on right now that, that affects the speed with which we speak. And Excellent. that's a big one to overcome. I purposely left some silence there and you wanted to jump in and fill I that did. silence, didn't you? <laughs> did. We all feel the same way. It is uncomfortable. That's why you practice. Practice having pauses. Practice slowing down. I, I think, I mean, that's lovely. That is so good. I think it's also because of the way that we converse with each other that we're all rushing to tell, you know, when we have conversations with each other, oh, I want to tell you what happened, I want to, or oh, you're debating, no, no, but this, this, and you're just jumping in, and, and, and that's how we talk but talking in the media is a different way of talking. And also, I mean, and I got this from my dad as well. He'd also, um, when he did public speaking, he'd say the best feedback, people would love my presentations on the times where I spoke really slowly. Um, so it, it actually makes a difference um, in media and in public speaking, that we make sure that we don't take our natural speaking styles of a conversation onto those situations because it doesn't work for those situations. Thank you, Andam. Um, and Marla just sent a note through saying Zyma had put their hand up while Jason was speaking. So Zyma, I mean, you can, you can put your question in the chat box or you can feel free to unmute and ask a question if you have one. So I'll pause. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll pass back to you, Marley. Awesome, and on that note, I will slow down as I am a notoriously fast speaker. <laughs> um, it helps when I'm rapping, but not so much when I'm presenting, sorry. Uh, so now I invite our final guest speaker to share how to communicate your cause effectively, who will also be facilitating a mini workshop with you all. Garth Nelland, sorry Garth, uh, Foreman is a founding partner at a social enterprise lead center for not-for-profit governance and leadership and is also a board member of Action Station Aotearoa, an organization campaigning for social justice and inclusion. As a long-term community activist, he has worked all his life in and around community benefit organizations, including 18 years teaching and researching in graduate programs on not-for-profit management, which included responsibility on courses on influencing public policy and social change. For six years, Garth led Australia's most influential anti-poverty and social justice advocacy organization. And with LEAD, he currently facilitates workshops and coaches nonprofit leaders on governance and strategy, monitoring and evaluation and advocacy and influence skills. Please welcome Garth, I pass the mic to you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Malu. And uh, it's quite uh, an honor to be on this uh, uh, panel. Um, I, I put in the comments that uh, Andrum's uh, 10 minutes was the best 10 minutes on uh, media I have ever heard condensed into such a, a rich little package and uh, some really great advice from Jason as well um, the, uh, on uh, how we influence messages. Um, so that's a bit of the disadvantage of going third, um, but the big advantage I've got is uh, that I've been asked to do a workshop as well. So I've got a little bit more, a little bit more time. Um, so I've got some uh, uh, slides I want to uh, share with you um, and uh, also going to get you to do some things with us together. Uh, so you'll see on the title slide that I've um, 
put a, a lever um, because usually when we're trying to communicate our cause, we don't have much power and we often don't have much money. Um, and so it, we might be think we're behind the eight ball, but whatever the case is, we certainly need all the leverage we can get. And uh, for me, communicating uh, your cause effectively is about maximizing that leverage so we can lift some uh, heavyweight influence uh, if, from wherever we happen to be. Uh, so I'm just gonna look at, us and ask you to look at, um, so I didn't need to, didn't mean to stop sharing that screen. Sorry. Um, the, uh, I'm just gonna ask you to look at two sentences and uh, see if you can uh, answer this uh, question, which, when you read those two sentences, which of those has a biggest impact on you? Uh, which of those uh, do you think is more persuasive? And hopefully a poll has popped up. Um, and as soon as you've uh, read the two, you can pop down your answers there. That it's completely anonymous. Pop them wherever you want. So about three quarters of us have voted. Everyone gets a chance to vote in this poll. So I'm gonna close it in a minute. Still a small number of people to vote. Don't want to lock you out. Okay, so we might end it there. Most of you have voted now. And there's a bit of a trend. So, uh, if you have a look at that, uh, you can see that only 93% of you uh, chose uh, sentence B. Um, and uh, I have to say that's a, a pretty usual, uh, a usual kind of pattern. Uh, so what I'm gonna ask you to do is, I'm gonna put you into some small groups to think about what it is in those sentences that um, particularly made it um, one more persuasive than the other. Uh, so see if you can identify uh, a couple, maybe even three particular features that made it more persuasive than others. So I'll share the screen again while I put you back, while I put you into pairs. You'll have five or six minutes, so say hello to the people uh, that you'll be thrown into a room with. Um, and if you are asked to give permission to go in a room, just click on that. Um, if for any reason you don't go into a breakout room with a group or it just freezes, um, I found this happens in about one or two percent of cases. So you might be the lucky one or two percent. Um, the best solution I've found is to actually leave the whole meeting. Um, so this is not a backdoor way of kicking you out. Just leave the whole meeting and then come back in again. And then I can relocate, reallocate you to a room. But if you get frozen, I can't move you from there. So you will need to leave. Okay. So just having a look again at the, at the two, um, uh, sentences and I'll, uh, put you into groups, breakout rooms of, 
five or six people. Okay. So have a look at that second sentence in particular, the one that 90% of you found more influential and persuasive and uh, have a chat with some friends.
Hi there, Susie. I didn't notice you were still in this room. Unfortunately, um, the people are just about to come back, so it's a bit too late to do anything. Great, welcome back everyone. Um, what I'd like you to do is to uh, just put in the chat uh, room box or the chat box um, some of the answers that you um, came up with. <clears throat> so Marlo, are you are you doing the same for our group or? You can do it. <laughs> yep. So uh, one group said specific number, the example of hamburger wrappers is a good example of a useless thing. Bit emotional, wrappers are approachable. The second had color, stats, place, and mentioning something specific it's used on, using statistics. Second sentence was specific, visual, fact-based. Specific and concrete. More classified, it strikes us more. It evokes feelings and by giving examples as well as conveying information. Keywords, tapping into human emotion. <coughs> Not a loose statement, but more specific, less arbitrary. Great, yes. So, um, I can see that uh, everyone here is uh, clearly, um, whoops. Wrong one, yep. Clearly a communication expert. Um, the, uh, uh, there are, uh, four or five particular things that seem to be um, especially um, a feature of influential or communication that has more impact. Uh, and we summarize them by the NEEDS acronym, N-E-E-D-S. So N, numbers or statistics, but selectively included, because if you put too many in, they, it becomes counterproductive and people just eyes glaze over. So it's the selective use of numbers. But people actually trust numbers more than words. Numbers make it more real. People talk about being specific. So they add to the credibility. Emotive language without being overly emotional. So it's uh, language that uh, conveys color, as one of you said, uh, that touches our emotions without being overly emotional. Uh, so it evokes feelings without looking uh, like it's just uh, going overboard. Again, too much emotive language can be counterproductive. The second E is examples we can identify with, like the hamburger wrappers and the junk mail. We know what they are. We see them every day. Um, the, uh, that, make it, that makes the communication uh, have more connection with us and uh, we're more likely to uh, be drawn into it. <coughs> and the D is direct and simple language. So it, uh, in being emotive, it doesn't use overly flowery language. It still, it still uses direct and simple language. Uh, so generally we've found that if, it, if uh, communication has these four or five features, it's much more likely to have an impact than be influential. Um, the fifth factor, the S, actually isn't demonstrated by these two sentences, but if we are trying to communicate for a cause, is very important. And that's that we are specific about what we want. So that we don't just 
uh, complain about a problem or we don't just offer uh, vague uh, ideas about what's needed, but the more specific we are about what we want, the more likely we are to um, influence people's uh, understandings. And there's, as well as the needs, there's two A's, which you'll see down the bottom of the screen in front of you. Um, always argue from the hearer's point of view. So get into what is the hearer expecting, what is the hearer understanding, what is the hearer likely to be approaching this issue from. And uh, as a kind of balance to that, anticipate the counter arguments or objections. So when anyone says, uh, you sometimes hear it said, or some people think that, uh, they're anticipating the counter arguments or the objections. And the big value of anticipating the counter arguments is it effectively takes the wind out of the sails of uh, arguments against you. Because if you've already uh, countered the argument, then people have to think up something, a new reason for doing that. Um, and uh, uh, now, Jim did that very effectively with her response to uh, Winston Peters about uh, uh, committing to New Zealand values. Uh, so when we anticipate the counter arguments, uh, communication is more likely uh, to be influential. Um, now, I'm just going to share with you um, a submission. Um, and uh, this is actually, I think, one of the most effective submissions I have uh, ever ever seen and ever read um, and it was produced by a student who went through one of our courses so it makes me all the more proud uh, this is actually the one page summary that went on top of a um, much bigger submission and I'm just going to find it now sorry I can't walk and chew gum at the same time I have to um, look at it uh, and what I'm going to do is, if you go in back into the um, uh, chat room, you'll be able to click on arthritissubmission.pdf and this will download onto uh, your computer or whatever device that you're using. Um, and you'll be able to open it up on your screen or if you're at a printer and want to, you can print it out. But it's just as good to open it on your screen. So what I'd like you to do is to have a look at that. And then when you do, see if you can identify, um, I'll give you a couple of minutes just of reading to, and see if you can identify the needs, N-E-E-D-S, and the two A's, argue from the hearer's point of view and anticipate the counter arguments in this submission. Um, the, uh, we won't be able to give you too much time to do that um, because we're running out of time. Um, but uh, you can come back and look at that later, but just at least have one look and see if you can see many of those aspects in there. People able to download the file okay? I couldn't, sorry. Can you please repeat how should we download it? Um, so if you go into the chat room, can you, have you been in there, Zari? Yes. Yep. Um, and there should be a little uh, icon that says arthritis submission. PDF. PDF. Yeah. yeah. Click yeah. on that and uh -huh. it should download onto your device. Okay. So you might need to double click. Okay. Download. Double click. Okay, yes, yes, thank you, Steve. The great thing about this submission, there was a bigger document behind it which had the um, scientific journals and other evidence supporting it, but in this submission um, was able to be summarized in just one page which is a great sign of success in being very focused because they were very specific about what they wanted. They were directing it to someone who had the power to make that decision 
and uh, they included arguments that they knew the decision maker would want to hear. Um, and they also um, anticipated some of the usual counter arguments because there's a lot of people arguing to put this drug or that drug onto uh, the uh, subsidized list. And I think you'll also be able to spot them using some numbers or statistics fairly selectively um, and using emotion, emotive without being overly emotional and using some examples that we can identify with and direct and fairly simple uh, language. I think the big test of direct and simple language is I don't know how many of you were experts on COX-2 inhibitors before you read this submission, um, but uh, you probably still understood it. Uh, I know nothing about the chemistry, but it made sense to me. That's a great evidence of them using direct and simple language. Okay, so we're gonna keep moving because there's a couple of other things I just wanted to leave with you. and. Uh, at the, uh, at the end of this, um, I've got a, a resource, which is an extract from Leeds, uh, a little book of influence that we'll uh, also uh, uh, put in the chat box for you to uh, download. And it includes uh, all of the uh, handy hints and ideas from the slides and some other uh, resources as well. Um, when, when we're using numbers, uh, there's, We've learned some lessons about how we uh, um, use numbers in ways that are more influential. And essentially what we need to do is to help people relate to the numbers. So these are uh, five ways, uh, four ways in which people can relate better to numbers. And this is sometimes referred to in, uh, in our field as social maths. So first is localization. Uh, that is breaking some a big number down into uh, a, an individual's or an individual country or an individual group's share of a bigger um, uh, picture. So, for example, rather than talking about the total share of public debt, when people want to frighten people with how big the public debt is, uh, you'll notice that politicians more often than not talk about each person's share. So that localises it, individualises it. Um, it's, that's overlaps with this idea of relativity. Um, so when people want to talk about uh, a number that might be uh, difficult to relate to, uh, they often use a metaphor of what it's equivalent to. So uh, we, uh, the number of deaths in road accidents in New Zealand is the equivalent to two fully loaded jumbo jet jets crashing every week. If two jumbo jets crashed every week in New Zealand, would we be doing something more about it? So you can, it puts it in perspective. Um, I made up that number, so don't take that. <laughs> um, I just used that as an example. It may be true or maybe not, I didn't uh, research it. Um, but also it's about impact. Um, so many lives would be saved, you know, with an estimate of the actual number as a result of compulsory seat belts. Or you might have heard when people talking about decisions made in uh, the COVID-19 that if we had have delayed the lockdown by an extra week, it's likely that another 10,000 people might have been infected. So uh, relate the number to the impact. It's not just um, a, uh, uh, a number for its own sake. The final message here, uh, which reinforces the point that Jason made is, the most powerful number is actually one. Um, where big numbers can re be related to one story. Uh, people relate more to the one individual than the 10,000 people affected by an earthquake or whatever uh, it might be. Um, so the what, when, you, when you do use numbers, it's useful to uh, marry them with a case story that makes it human and real and relatable. So that's the quick message on uh, social maths. And uh, I'll just give you another example here to show how it can be used powerfully. So this is from uh, the US um, where 
uh, they did a campaign about trying to address school dropouts. Um, and the poster says, 7,000 high school students drop out of school every day. That's a stack of desks, the equivalent of 12 Empire State buildings high. So again, it makes a number that you might just glance, uh, glance over very quickly, like 7,000 high school students every school day, makes them something that uh, you can relate to, and in this case, hopefully be a little bit frightened by. A stack of desks, 12 Empire State buildings high. Okay, so the... Uh, I also wanted to talk about um, how we frame the debate. And again, Jason has mentioned a little bit of this and has provided a really good foundation for us to, to build on the couple of ideas that I want to add about how we frame debates. Um, and in the resources, uh, you'll find a fantastic resource called uh, What Nonprofits Can Learn from Homer Simpson. And uh, this is about how, uh, I think it's subtitled, Why Homer Simpson is More Influential Than Spock. Um, and it talks about how connecting to people emotionally actually is the point at which you start to influence rather than uh, just, logic, just logical arguments alone. It's a great book and there's a free download ebook available for you on the link that uh, we've, uh, we'll give you. Um, so what do we mean by framing the debate? Well, actually what I would like to do now, instead of defining it myself, is to show you a really quick um, little uh, video, if this works. Oh, now I can't see it. Here we are. Uh, technology. That's not the one I want. Your idea. Come on. No, nope, that's not the one I want. Why is it doing that? It's being very naughty. Um, sorry about this. Fortunately, times were hard. The city of Troy. Okay. Sorry about this. I'll try that again. <laughs> There once was a library, a beautiful, busy, award. No, library. Unfortunately, times were hard. The city of Troy, Michigan no longer had enough money for its library, so it scheduled a vote, asking the townspeople to approve a small tax increase. This angered an anti-tax group known as the Tea Party. Well organized and well funded, they started posting vote no signs, mailing flyers, and making noise. They dominated the conversation, changing the topic from library, books, and reading to taxes, taxes, taxes. With no money and an election less than a month away, the library needed help. 
They needed something attention-getting, audacious, maybe even vile. So we decided to form a group of our own and started planting signs around town that said, Vote to close the library August 2nd. Book burning party August 5th. The idea of book burning is bad enough, but gleefully making it a party, well, that angered people enough to send them to our Facebook page. You people are sick. This is disgusting. Reject the wackos. Vote yes. But we didn't stop there. We created videos. Imagine this times 200,000. How cool is that? Posted on Twitter. The Troy Library might be short on money, but it has books to burn. Created items for sale. A book bag. How ironic. We placed newspaper ads, created check-ins, posted flyers, and lined up entertainment. You guys are booking a band? People became enraged. Why would you burn books, idiots? This is horrible. Cheap imbeciles. What the f*** is this world coming we to? We should burn your signs instead. Complete and total this idiots. Really Shut this bitch down. That. Jerks. They posted their own links, shared with friends, debated the merits of libraries and the audacity of burning books. The conversation spread from Facebook to city council meetings, from newspapers to TV. It grew from local to national, even international news. Once it reached a fevered pitch, we revealed the true intent of our campaign. A vote against the library is like a vote to burn books. And people started posting, tweeting, and reporting all over again. In the end, we had changed the conversation completely, from taxes, 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 to library, library, library. And on August 2nd, the yes voters, voters who don't normally turn out to vote, turned out at levels 342% greater than projected. And the library won by a landslide. The town's library, its beautiful, award-winning library, had been saved. Not every story at the library has a happy ending. Fortunately, this one did. Okay. Um... So there's a couple of lessons there. One of them is social change can be fun as well. Uh, there's no, it's no crime to enjoy ourselves uh, when we're uh, achieving important goals. Uh, but uh, basically what that was about was reframing the issue. The first party into the group, uh, into the issue had framed the, the referendum as uh, do we want an increase in taxes? Interestingly, it was a 0.7% increase to pay for libraries for the next 10 years. Um, the, uh, but uh, once they'd framed the debate as taxes, 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 it was very hard to argue against it. So they had, this group had to do extra work to reframe the debate uh, as actually being about libraries and the value of libraries and is it worth 0.7% uh, tax increase to pay for them. Uh, and they they did it by um, a reverse psychology, I guess, by just taking the argument uh, of closing down libraries to the extreme by, let's say, let's burn books as well, uh, and made people focus on what was really at stake. So that's what framing is about. It's how we see the debate within the terms, uh, the terms within which we uh, see the debate or not. Um, so... Um, here's some examples of uh, different um, ways of framing. Um, some of you remember the anti, the debate about the anti-smacking laws. Uh, they were never called that. They were called the uh, Child Discipline Exception to the Crimes Act, something or other um, bill. Uh, but its opponents very quickly branded the uh, discussion as being a, uh, about whether you are anti-smacking or not, whether you're interfering in parents' rights to, uh, to, to smack their children. Um, the, uh, they won, the opponents won the framing debate because no one was able to change it from being an anti-smacking bill, no matter how hard they tried, and people were trying very hard. Um, but ironically, it also shows you that just winning frame winning the frame of the debate doesn't actually mean you win in the end because uh, the opponents of that law actually lost, as it turned out, and um, the Crimes Act was amended to not give an exception for child discipline uh, to assault. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the 
the sky has not collapsed since then, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, the, uh, uh, so, but it, it is really hard to change a frame once it's in place. And that one, no one could change the frame. Uh, down on the bottom right hand uh, corner of your screen, uh, you, those of you who are from Christchurch uh, will remember the uh, ubiquitous road cones that are still here in a fair quantity, but actually covered the city in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake. Um, and the road cones were kind of seen negatively. They were seen as a sign of destruction. Um, but here was a part of a, a campaign uh, by the council to try and redefine road cones as signs of progress, not as signs of destruction. Um, and, and to uh, redefine um, uh, how people saw them as not a, not a uh, problem to lament, but as a milestone on the way to uh, uh, progress in uh, fixing up the roads and underground pipes um, around the city. Don't know whether that was too successful as reframing either, because once a, once a frame sticks in people's minds, it's very hard to move. But there are often competing frames. Um, so <coughs> on the bottom left-hand corner, top right-hand corner, um, there are both statements that people, most people would probably agree with, uh, at, at least at one level. Um, it's hard to disagree with the idea of being one law for all. Um, though that was used to uh, try and undermine the impact of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, and who were disagreeing with, who would disagree with honouring a treaty? Uh, so both sides of this argument tried to put in positive terms that aligned with values uh, that most people aspire to, the kind of values that Jason was talking about earlier, to put their argument in line with those values, equity and equality, uh, honouring our commitments, um, standing up for something that we said we would do, uh, commit, standing up for a commitment that we've made, both things that uh, most people most of the time strongly support. So framing is about connecting your cause and your argument with those uh, values that, that people identify with. Um, it's also why you might notice when politicians are interviewed, uh, they will often say, well, that's an interesting question, but the real issue here, Susan, or whoever the interviewer is, uh, and basically what they're saying is, I don't want to answer your question. I want to keep talking about my frame on this issue. Um, and uh, they're trying to bring the debate back to their perspective, um, their framework. And that can sometimes be successful, sometimes not successful. So the one of the big lessons from this is, the early worm gets the frame. Um, the, we need to get out early if we want to frame a debate and we need to be persistent if we want to keep the debate framed in our, in our terms because there will be a big competition uh, for ideas. Um, the uh, last thing I want to share with you in, um, in my last few moments, I hope, is just this, the issue of newsworthiness. Um, and so to do that, what I'd like you to do is, I'm just gonna give you, um, oh, we don't, we don't really have time to put you back into the into groups to do this, so we won't, sorry. We'll just, um, we won't do this as an exercise, we'll just do this individually um, so that we can be faithful to the commitment we made about time. Um, the, uh, uh, what I'd like you to do is to individually think of uh, the last piece of news that sticks in your mind, just one, you had to narrow it down to one, the last piece of news you heard, saw, or otherwise uh, got from the media, old, new, social, whatever, that um, sticks in your mind. What, what is that? What's the most memorable bit of news? Okay, once you've got that, everyone got that okay? Nod your head. <laughs> yep. Um, what I'd like you to think about now is why. Why was that more memorable than other bits of news that you might have heard since or that were around at the same time? Think about why that was more memorable. Now, I'm going to read your mind 
and tell you what you're thinking now, <laughs> hopefully, um, because we don't have time for to get the feedback from you. So I hope I'm correct when I say that probably these seven features uh, appeared somewhere in your reasoning or one or more of them appeared somewhere in your reasoning about um, why this was a memorable piece of news. Uh, there are, something is newsworthy to the media because we as consumers of the media are attracted to it and remember it. So if we want to blame anyone for what the news media, new, old, social, whatever features, the only people to look to to that is in the mirror. Uh, it, the readers, the consumers, the watchers, the listeners of that media, because we determine what they give importance to by and large. I'm oversimplifying, but by and large. And often they're around one or more of these seven factors. Uh, is it current? Is it topical? Um, that's the first and probably constant requirement for something to be newsworthy. Old, out of date, not topical is um, rarely uh, will your issue be newsworthy if those characteristics describe it. Is it novel or unusual or unexpected? Um, like the dog that's raising kittens um, or an unusual alliance between uh, business people and trade unions or something that's unexpected. Is it highly significant? Is it big? Um, generally, the bigger it is, something is, the more newsworthy it is. Number of people involved, number of dollars involved, uh, number of issues involved. Usually the bigger it is, the more likely it is to be newsworthy. Is there some conflict or tension um, there's an old news saying, if it bleeds, it leads, not a very pleasant description, but essentially what that means is that we like to read about, uh, conflict, not when things we're not, we're less inclined to read about things going smoothly. Um, is it close to us proximity? Do we feel some connection with us? And I just want to share with you briefly a map of the world. Uh, proximity is not um, ge only geographical. Uh, proximity also means, uh, is it affecting people like us? And when I say like us, I mean whoever's in control of the media. Uh, so with a uh, white Anglo dominated English speaking media, we tend to find things more tragic and therefore more newsworthy from other white Anglo spe English speaking countries and uh, the countries that we have less connection with seem to be further away so we have to push harder when we're um, uh, trying to find connection with countries that are not identified that the owners and uh, uh, writers in our media don't identify with that's proximity prominence um, when Queen Elizabeth breaks a leg, it's much more news than when Garth and Alan Foreman breaks a leg. You know, this is the celebrity or the prominent factor. Um, and then finally, there's the factor that contradicts almost all of the above, human interest. This is the warm and fluffy story that just brings a smile to your face. It may not be significant. It may not be uh, nearby. It doesn't really matter what country it's in. Uh, it doesn't even have to be topical. You'll find some very old news in human interest. Uh, but somehow that's just something that uh, appeals to us um, as uh, as human beings. Okay, the I just wanted to uh, finish um, with a quote from Margaret Mead, who uh, once I think very wisely said, "Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has." So, because I really want to encourage all of us um, to be great change makers and working in and with the media is a part of making that change. Kakatea Thank you so much, Garth. Um, 
I loved your quote there at the end, as committed citizens, we can all change the world. That's really stuck with me. Just very mindful of time. Unfortunately, we don't have a time for Q&A. However, we will be taking questions post Hui, so please send them through to me and Maulu. And if, Garth, if you're okay with it, we can perhaps send the questions on to you and to our other speakers. Um, just want to say thank you so much for doing such an informative and highly incisive workshop in 45 minutes online as well. So I think hats off to you, Garth, and thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, to bring the hui to a close, I also want to thank our other expert speakers and firstly, Anjum, for being our tireless community advocate. Thank you so much. Um, Jason, thank you for your calm wisdom and your expert insights. I've learned a lot. I need to pause sometimes. Um, so, and, but most importantly, thank you to you all, our participants, for um, joining this important mahi um, and for the important work that you all do with and for our communities. Um, and I'll just pass the mic to Malu to say some closing words. Cool. So after this hui, we will be sharing a resource pack with you all, along with opportunities for more media training. As we know, some people in the registration highlighted um, some areas that they wanted some additional help, not covered here, or all covered here, um, some around cultural competencies and around some key areas, uh, social media platforms, which will do our best to help connect you with those opportunities. So please stay tuned. And from us to you, Nga mihi nui. Kia koe, take care, until the next time, so fast we've worked. Namahi nui.